Let's open to John chapter 18 in our Bibles, the Gospel by John chapter 18. John 18 in your Bibles, and I would like to just rehearse with you who rose from that tomb. And what I'm going to do is just you follow along. I'm going to read John 18 and 19 uh, portions of it, and I want to point out in each section the, the character of the one who before the cross was this way, and because Jesus never changes, this is how he was after the cross. He, the one we can tell who rose from the tomb by looking at who went in and what he was like before that. Let me show you what I mean in chapter 18, verses 1 through 11. And what we see here in this account is the first element of who rose from that tomb and walked out of it was one who had a name. Now, as I'm reading these verses, think about what Paul says. He says that Jesus has a name that's above every name, that at the name of Jesus, what will happen? Yeah, every knee shall bow. We get a little foretaste of that in chapter 18. When he finished praying in the Garden of Gethsemane, Jesus left with his disciples and crossed the Kidron Valley. On the other side, there was an olive grove, and he and his disciples went into it. And so he had just finished that high priestly prayer. He's headed to Gethsemane. They walk over that little uh, Kidron brook and go into that olive grove, and he and his disciples went into it. Now Judas, who betrayed him, knew the place, because Jesus had often met there with his disciples. So Judas came to the grove, guiding a detachment of soldiers and some officials from the chief priests and Pharisees. They were carrying torches, lanterns, and weapons. Jesus, knowing all that was going to happen to him, went out and asked them, who is it that you want? Verse 5, Jesus of Nazareth, they replied, I am. He said, I am. M. He said the name. And when he said the name, look what happens. And Judas the traitor was standing there with them. And so I assume that that was added to say that he likewise got the, the uh, um, uh, involuntary bowing that went on. But uh, when Jesus said, I am, they drew back and fell to the ground. Now, the question is, who has a name above all others that every knee shall bow before? Jesus Christ, the Lord. And he was declared to be the Son of God with power when he rose from the dead. So, in these verses, who was it that walked out of that tomb? One who had a name. Let's keep reading. Verse 10, Simon Peter, who had a sword, drew it and struck the high priest's servant, cutting off his right ear. The servant's name was Malchus. And this shows that John wrote much later because he wouldn't have written this right after the fact. That would have been kind of like indicting Peter. You know, it, in, in Mark's gospel, which is earlier, it, it says, and one drew a sword. John pegs him. It's Peter, okay? So it's interesting. You can tell the chronology of the gospels. Um, verse 11, Jesus commanded Peter, put away your sword. Shall I not drink the cup the Father has given me? What a r- just amazing change from just prior to this, when Jesus was with strong crying and tears crying out and saying, Father, take this cup. And so what we're going to see in this passage, keeping on down through it, is that Jesus, the one who had the name, also was the one who had no fear. Now that's hard for us to understand, no fear. Most humans live in kind of a rolling uh, cloud of fears, When we're little, we're afraid of the dark. When we get a little older, we're afraid of speaking in front of people. When we're a little older, we're afraid we'll never get a job. We get the job, we're afraid we're not going to be able to keep the job. We get a little older, and we're afraid someone's going to take our money. We get a little older, and we're afraid for our health. We get a little older, and we're afraid of the grave. And we just live in this rolling cloud of fear. The one who stepped out of that tomb had no fear. Look at verse 12. The detachment of soldiers... Uh, with its commander of the Jewish officials, arrested Jesus. They bound him, and they brought him first to Annas, who was the father of Caiaphas, the high priest that year. And Caiaphas was the one who advised the Jews it would be good if one man died for the people. 
Verse 15, Simon Peter and another disciple were following Jesus because the disciple was known to the high priest. He went in with Jesus into the high priest's courtyard, but Peter had to wait outside at the door. The other disciple who was known to the high priest came back and spoke to the girl on duty there and brought Peter in. And verse 17, you are not one of his disciples, are you? The girl at the door asked Peter. He replied, because of his fear, I am not. You notice the one who is facing the biggest danger is standing serenely, confidently, with such stature, that's Jesus, and the one who wasn't even in trouble is scared to death. It's such a picture of who Jesus is. Um, Verse uh, 18, it was cold and the servants and the officials stood around a fire they had made to keep warm. Peter also was standing with them, warming himself. Meanwhile, the high priest questioned Jesus about his disciples and his teaching and said, I've spoke, Jesus said, I've spoken openly in the world. I always taught in the synagogues at the temple where all the Jews came together. I said nothing in secret. Why question me? Ask those who heard me. Surely they know what I said. Verse 22, when Jesus said this, one of the officials nearby struck him in the face. Is this the way you answer the high priest, he demanded? If I said something wrong, Jesus replied, testify as to what was wrong. But if I spoke the truth, why did you strike me? Then Annas sent him still bound to Caiaphas, the high priest. Second indicator of who rose from that tomb on resurrection morn, one who had a name, and secondly, one who had no fear Jesus walked confidently into the darkness. He walked with his own creatures that hated him, yet he walked in quietness and confidence. Who is absolutely fearless? Jesus Christ, the Lord, declared to be the Son of God with power by the resurrection from the dead. Continue reading in verse 25 because there's another element to identify who it was that rose from the dead. Not only the one with the name and the one with no fear, but also one who confidently possessed a perfect knowledge of the future. Watch as this unfolds. Verse 25, Simon Peter stood warming himself. He was asked, are you not one of his disciples? And he denied, says, I am not. Verse 26, one of the high priest's servants, a relative of the man whose ear Peter had cut off, challenged him. Didn't I see you with him in the olive grove? I mean, I I saw my relative get his ear cut off. Verse 27, again, Peter denied it. Now look at this. And at that moment, a rooster began to crow. Now, put that event with what Mark says. Listen to what Mark says in verse uh, 27 of chapter 14. You don't have to turn there. I'll read it for you. Jesus said this, chapter 14, you will all fall away, Jesus told them, for it's written, I will strike the shepherd and the sheep will be scattered. But after I have risen, I will go ahead of you into Galilee. Peter declared, even if all fall away, I will not. Jesus answers, I tell you the truth. Today, yes, tonight. Look at the precision of his perfect knowledge. Yes, tonight. Before the rooster crows twice, you yourself will disown me three times. Who rose from that grave One who possessed perfect knowledge of all events. Think about it. Who alone knows all? Everything Jesus said happened. And the only one who knows all is the one who came out of that tomb. Jesus Christ our Lord declared to be the Son of God with power by the resurrection from the dead. Let's keep reading in verse 28 of John 18. And we're going to look at The one who possessed deity is the one who came out of that tomb. The Jews led Jesus from Caiaphas, verse 28, to the palace of the Roman governor. By now it was early morning. And to avoid ceremony uncleanness, the Jews did not enter the palace. They wanted to be able to eat the Passover. So Pilate came out to them and asked, What charges are you bringing against this man? Verse 30, If he were not a criminal, they replied, We would not have handed him over to you. Pilate said, take him then yourselves and judge him by your own law. But we have no right to execute anyone, the Jews objected. 
This happened so that the words Jesus had spoken indicating the kind of death he was going to die would be fulfilled. Again, his perfect knowledge being reflected. Verse 33, Pilate then went back inside the palace, summoned Jesus, and asked him, Are you the king of the Jews? Verse 34, Is that your own idea? Jesus asked. Or did others talk to you about me? By the way, this is the only one that Jesus in this final time carried on any conversation with. Pilate, he was truly ministering to him at this time. And verse 35, am I a Jew, Pilate replied? It was your people and your chief priests that hand you over to me. What is it you've done? Now look at this. Jesus said, my kingdom is not of this world. That, that must have been eerie to a man who sat at the top of of the kingdoms of the world. He knew the kingdoms, Pilate did. He was an official legate, an official governor, an official military attache to the king of most of the earth. And Jesus said, I'm above all this stuff that you've spent your life in. If it were not my servants, if it were, my servants would fight to prevent my arrest by the Jews. But now my kingdom is from another place. He says, I'm not from here. I'm from another place. Verse 37 You're a king then, Pilate said. Jesus answered, you're right in saying I'm a king. In fact, for this reason I was born and for this reason I came into the world from somewhere else again. See, he's he's saying things that disturbed Pilate. To testify to the truth, everyone on the side of truth listens to me. Now, fast forward to uh, verse 7 of the 19th chapter. Look down there. The Jews insisted, we have a law, and according to that law, he must die, because he claimed to be the Son of God. Verse 8, when Pilate heard this, look what it says, he was even more afraid. Why? Because someone was there who was not of this world. And what it was was one possessing deity. Did you know it is hard to be in the presence of God and not sense it? And what it did to the religious leaders was the same thing it did to them when they were in the temple and when they were in the precincts and the courtyards and the sacrifices. It hardened them. But momentarily being in the presence of God frightened Pilate. And it says, verse 9, he went back inside the palace. Where did you come from? He asked Jesus, but Jesus gave him no answer. Who was it that stepped from the tomb that day? One who possessed deity. Who alone is not from this world? Jesus Christ our Lord, declared to be the Son of God with power by the resurrection from the dead. Well, continue reading in verse 38 of chapter 18 with me. It says this, What is truth, Pilate said. With this he went out against, again to the Jews and said, and I'm going to underline these in your mind, I find no basis for a charge against him. That's the first time he says it. Verse 39, But it is your custom for me to release to you one prisoner at the time of the Passover. Do you want me to release the king of the Jews? And they shouted back, No, not him. Give us Barabbas. Now Barabbas had taken part in a rebellion. Now in chapter 19, verse 1, Then Pilate took Jesus and had him flogged. The soldiers twisted together a crown of thorns and put it on his head, and they clothed him in a purple robe. And they went up to him again and again, saying, Hail, King of the Jews! And they struck him in the face. Once more Pilate came out and said to the Jews, Look, I'm bringing him out to you second time to let you know I find no basis for a charge against him. Not only no charge... I don't even find a basis for a charge. I don't even find a grounds for a charge. I don't even find a place I could charge him for anything wrong. Interesting. Verse 7, the Jews insisted, we have a law, and according to that law, he must die. He claimed to be the Son of God. And then we already read these verses. When Pilate heard this, he was even more afraid. And verse 12 From then on, Pilate tried to set Jesus free. But the Jews kept shouting, If you let this man go, you're no friend of Caesar. And when Pilate heard this, he brought Jesus and sat down in the judge's seat at a place known as a stone pavement, which is in Aramaic, Gabbatha. It was the day of the preparation of Passover week, about the sixth hour. Here is your king, Pilate said to him. 
are said to the Jews, but they shouted, take him away, take him away, crucify him. Pilate asked, shall I crucify your king? And they answered, the chief priests answered, we have no king but Caesar. Verse 16, finally, finally, after saying four times, I don't see he's done anything wrong. Finally, Pilate handed him over to them to be crucified. Who stepped from the tomb on resurrection morning? One who was sinless. He was sinless so that he could become sin for us. He was sinless so that he could bear our sins. He was sinless so he could apply his perfect life to us, so that we could absorb his righteousness and so that he could absorb our sins. So who stepped from the tomb? One who was sinless who is the only one who can ever stand even the scrutiny of those who hated him and could have no fault found in him. Just one, Jesus Christ, our Lord, declared to be the Son of God with power by the resurrection from the dead. Verse 17 of John 19. Who was it who rose from the dead? Well, verse 17 says he carried his own cross. He went to the place of the skull, which in Aramaic is called Golgotha. Here they crucified him and with him two others, one on each side and Jesus in the middle. Pilate had a notice prepared, fastened to the cross. It read, Jesus of Nazareth, King of the Jews. And many of the Jews read this sign for the place where Jesus was crucified was near the city. And the sign was written in Aramaic, Latin, and Greek, which, by the way, Pilate wrote himself. So that means he was fluent in all three which is a a very significant thing, as we talked about in the way he wrote it. Verse 21, the chief priests of the Jews protested to Pilate and said, do not write the king of the Jews, but that this man claimed to be the king of the Jews. And Pilate said, what I've written, I have written. And when the soldiers crucified Jesus, they took his clothes. They divided him into four shares, one for each of them, with the undergarment remaining. This garment was seamless, woven in one piece from top to bottom. Let's not tear it, they said to one another. Let's decide by lot who will get it. This has happened, that the scriptures might be fulfilled, which said they divided my garments among them. Verse 25, near the cross of Jesus stood his mother. Verse 26, when he saw his mother and disciple whom he loved standing nearby, he said to his mother, dear woman, here is your son. And we could go on through all the the precious comments. But you know what? Every time I read this, what strikes me, do you know who it was that rose from the grave? Not only one who had a name and who was sinless and one who was divine and one who was fearless, but one who was, even at his most dire moment of death, gracious, grace-filled. You notice that what comes out of Christ is blessing and not cursing. What comes out of Christ is forgiveness and not bitterness. What comes out of Christ is offerings of salvation and not calling down judgment on them. Let me ask you this. Who can endure bearing shame and scoffing rude and stand perfectly at peace? And who could have called 10,000 angels and didn't? And as they mocked the name of Jesus, those mighty armies of God could have stood poised at the battlements of heaven with their swords drawn ready to start Armageddon at that instant. But the call never came because Jesus was gracious As a hymn writer said, he could have called 10,000 angels to destroy the world and to set him free, but he died alone for you and me. So who was it that rose from the tomb on resurrection morning? Jesus Christ, our Lord, who was declared to be the Son of God with power by the resurrection from the dead. Just one more that I want you to look at. It says in chapter 20, and if you want to turn over there to the first verse with me. Early on the first day of the week, while it was still dark, Mary Magdalene went to the tomb and saw the stone had been removed from the entrance. And so she came running to Simon Peter and the other disciple, the one Jesus loved, and said, They have taken the Lord out of the tomb, and we don't know where they've put him. So Peter and the other disciple started for the tomb. Both were running. But the other disciple outran Peter and reached the tomb first. And he bent over and looked in at the strips of cloth and lying there but did not go in verse 6 then Simon Peter who was behind him arrived and went in the tomb and he saw the strips of linen lying there as well as the burial cloth that had been around Jesus head the cloth was folded up by itself separate from the linen and finally the other disciple who had reached the tomb first also went inside 
he saw and believed. Who rose from the tomb that day? One who was omnipotent. For he had declared that I willingly lay down my life and I will raise it up again. The ultimate display of power. He raised himself from the dead. He predicted it. He did it because he's God. And so who can be executed by professional killers? Who can be buried for three days? And who can then walk out of the grave at just the moment he said he would? One who is omnipotent, Jesus Christ our Lord, declared to be the Son of God with power by the resurrection of the dead. So tonight, who have we come to meet with? Who have we come to celebrate? Who have we come to worship? We've come to worship Jesus, the one who had a name that is above every name. To worship Jesus, the one who has no fear, no matter what he goes through. The one who possessed perfect knowledge then and today. The one who possesses divinity, who is divine. The one who was sinless, the one who is gracious, and the one who is omnipotent. And if he says, neither do I condemn thee, he won't condemn thee. And if he said, go and leave your life of sin, he gives us the power because he's all powerful. And if we fear, he's fearless. And if we feel that we are worthless and have nothing, he says, I have a name that's above every name and I bestow my grace on you. And I ask you to come and worship me. Let's bow before him right now. Father in heaven, we thank you for your body that you prepared for Jesus, a body thou hast prepared for me. And thank you that he came and said, in the volume of the book it is written of me, I come to do your will, and thank you that he did your will perfectly, completely fulfilling all righteousness so that I can stand before you clothed in him tonight and you can see me as you see him and his righteousness is imputed to me and to us. I pray that we would be strengthened by your spirit within and that our hope would so well within us in our joy and our peace that gratitude would flow from our lips as we worship you 